organize this. All right. So I'm going to be talking about tooth whitening and some strategies to help um, improve tooth whitening for everybody. Um, I'd like to mention that um, because there's so many people signed on tonight, I won't be able to answer questions. If you go onto my Instagram, which is over here, Greenwall Dental, and send me your questions on Greenwall Dental, after we finish tonight, I'm happy to answer questions. Um, all the information is on, um, if you want to download any of the information I'm giving you, you can go on to lindagreenwall.com and go to resources and the information will be there. Many of the articles that I've published are all there. You just download that um, and just download whatever you need. So the reason there's strawberries here, there's a strawberry, is that people are, locked, are on lockdown and they are trying to do self-care. Now, there is a myth that says that um, strawberries with bicarbonate, crushed strawberries and bicarbonate, can help you with your whitening. It is a myth, and so it was tested scientifically. Um, study that was done by Dr. Soran Kwan at the University of Loma Linda. She crushed the strawberries with the bicarb and placed it onto patients' teeth, as well as they had a control where they checked um, with 10% carmide peroxide, showing the carmide peroxide was much better. The strawberries did work a tiny little bit, one shade lighter or two, but the main whitening is with the home bleaching products that we're going to talk about tonight. So if you will follow, if you go onto lindagreenwall.com, go to resources and you can download, we're going to talk about the first article in a minute. Um, follow me on Facebook, Linda Greenwald's Dental Practice and Instagram. Um, I don't know if you know, but 10 years ago, I set up a dental charity and we work very hard to help the children in the UK. We're looking after nearly 5,000 uh, children with their toothbrushing. Over the last few weeks, we've been delivering to the elderly care facilities um, tooth kits, uh, teeth brush, toothbrushing and um, toothpaste. And if you know of any elderly care facilities in your area, I would like to challenge you to do the same. If you need toothbrushes for the elderly care um, in your area, the elderly, please um, contact us through Dental Wellness Trust and we're happy to do that. Um, and to deliver toothbrushes to those areas. What I want to talk about tonight is the classification of bleaching, uh, tooth whitening, predictable treatment planning, some new materials using 5% combined peroxide, uh, management of tooth sensitivity, and a, a four-step model of whitening, uh, microabrasion, resin infiltration. Um, we will probably be about an hour and a quarter and I'll try and be quite quick. But there's, I would like you to go and download on the article, the download the um, lindagreenwell.com, carmide peroxide and its use in oral hygiene and oral health. Now, um, on the 13th of March, we received this article um, called Transmissions Roots of uh, COVID um, in Co and Controls in Dental Practice. On the 13th of March, this article is written by Peng, um, published now just um, a month ago. And in this article, it's a, from the Chinese dentists who describe um, how they were practicing the issues, the association, the aerosol generating procedures, and um, how they were working and the importance of the disease and how it affects dental practice. Um, so please have a look at this article. If you need it afterwards, I'm happy to send it to you. Um, but that in on the third, this is only two weeks ago on the 13th of March, actually three weeks ago, actually changed our practice forever. When we saw the issues concerning aerosol generating procedures and the difficulty of working, we realized that we as a dental profession are going to need to work in different ways going forward. Um, what it showed was that um, they were using hydrogen peroxide as a mouthwash for every patient prior to commencing any treatment. And um, that in, we use it as peroxyl. And we, we, we started on that day um, changing into full scrubs, wearing hats, uh, masks, face visors, barrier gowns, shoes, shoe protection. Uh, shoe protection. And we realized that that is how we're going to 
need to go forward in the COVID outbreak and afterwards. Um, I think afterwards we will need to we will need to test all our patients to see their COVID immunity. And as dentists um, who are redeployed or volunteering in hospitals, there is a crossover with dentists and medics. And I think in our practices, we will be all needing to run the finger prick tests for patients to check their COVID status and the immunity before we commence practice. So what I wanted to do in this article, they speak about hydrogen peroxide and how the surfaces were decontaminated um, using sodium hypochlorite. Um, they looked at clausidyl, um, sodium hypochlorate and hydrogen peroxide. Now we know that hydrogen peroxide has major oral health benefits and is an antiseptic and a disinfectant as well. So these are the benefits of carbamide peroxide. And um, carbamide peroxide is the main bleaching product which we use, and we use it in 5, 10, and 16%. And we'll be talking quite a bit about this. Um, the benefits of carbamide peroxide, I prefer carbamide peroxide for patients compared to hydrogen peroxide. Carbamide per, uh, peroxide is used as, as a night product because it remains active. It has an ingredient called carbopol, which um, can sustain the oxygen for up to 10 hours. So all the way through the night, the oxygen has been released slowly, so it has major benefits. So if we talk about the COVID world that we live in, first of all, tonight, I want to wish our Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, a speedy and full recovery as quick as possible, because we heard the news tonight that he's gone into ITU. And we, we are all thinking of him and wish him a speedy and full recovery. In addition to all those patients who are in hospital suffering severely from the disease, we are thinking of them all. And we wish our dental and medical colleagues well during this time and everybody should be well and stay well. So let's talk about now carbamide peroxide. So the first thing that carbamide peroxide does, it, has, it elevates the pH in the mouth. Um, and during this time, we've had quite a few phone calls from patients asking for whitening gel um, because self-care also goes to mouth care and oral care and oral health improvement. Now, we know that carbamide peroxide has major oral health improvements, and that's what I want to talk about first tonight. So the carbamide peroxide first helps with elevating the pH in the mouth. When it does that, it helps with wound healing, and it helps um, with soft tissue irritation. So the elevation also helps with wound healing. Any minor irritations can be healed. There is, is a reduction in caries, in root decay, and in tooth decay. The carbopol, which is a slow-release oxygen agent, helps to sustain the oxygen, and that is why it is effective all the way through the night. So I call the technique um, therapeutic aesthetics because we are doing whitening, but we're also doing healing. So the question you may have is, how can we do whitening during this COVID time when our patients are in lockdown? Um, and what are the benefits for our patients? First of all, the whitening, the carbamide peroxide has improved gingival health, reduction in uh, gingival swelling, um, improved oral hygiene, and also improve the patients brush their teeth more. You can use it in an ortho tray to your Invisalign tray to reduce the white spot lesions and also improves mouth cleanliness. And then there's the question of disinfection. So the ortho trays can be disinfected with a little bit of carbamide peroxide as well and um, placed in the tray overnight. But because the carbamide peroxide is really good for caries for root, root decay and tooth decay reduction, this is a way to keep your mouth healthy during this time. The benefits as well of using hydrogen peroxide is that there is improved oral health. There's, um, it can be used as a mouth rinse, as we said. Um, and if you can get peroxyl, some of the stores are out of peroxyl, but if you can get peroxyl, it's very useful to use to rinse with. And going forward for patients, we will need to use that for them as a mouth rinse prior to treatment. The hydrogen peroxide can also be used as a disinfectant and um, as a decontaminant. So it's good as the mouthwash 
Um, then they looked at um, corsidil in comparison to hydrogen peroxide, and they found that the hydrogen peroxide was actually more, um, more bactericidal. Um, you, you can use it as a toothbrush disinfectant as well, disinfectant, and um, to treat minor mouth irritations. Um, the foaming areas bring the oxygen to the area to help with healing. So now you may ask in terms of questions, is it going to kill viruses? And does it, we know that it kills bacteria, but does it actually kill viruses? It also, um, there's a reduction in the oral biofilm and can, um, can also reduce buildup on dentures. So um, we have actually released an article. And if you want a copy of that, please contact me afterwards. We sent a newsletter to all our patients at the moment explaining what they can do for self-care at home. And one of the things they can do is to disinfect their own toothbrush. If they have, if they have um, suffered from the disease, they should throw away their toothbrush and get a new toothbrush because we discovered that the coronavirus remains in the saliva, though you still do virus shedding. And there was a report that it was up to three weeks, but the last report I said it went on for 49 days. So consider throwing away your toothbrush if you've had the disease or trying to um, reduce, to, to disinfect your toothbrush. But I would suggest you instruct your patients to throw their toothbrush away and get a new toothbrush. This latest study here by Kampf, uh, which was published a few weeks ago, they looked at how you can disinfect the surfaces. And they looked at 62% ethanol, 0.5% um, hydrogen peroxide, or 0.1% sodium hypochlorite. This combination can deactivate surfaces in one minute against coronavirus. Now, you know we've been instructed about um, the fact that the coronavirus can stay active on plastic for three days and for metal for up to a week and for paper for 24 hours. So using a spray at home on your um, kitchen surfaces, but any stuff coming in with this can deactivate things in one minute. I know that we all, our dental practices are closed, but it's good to know that you can use a combination of this in your own surfaces at home. Um, the hydrogen peroxide was also used in eardrops and eye drops for neonates. So it is a very effective, uh, very effective uh, disinfectant. So let's look at how you can use hydrogen peroxide as an oral health healer during this time. Um, ortho patients, we mentioned, you can use it for cleaning appliances, but also for an ortho patient in retention, if you give them 5% carmide peroxide to use at night, you will have improved gingival health, imp reduction in swelling, reduction in plaque retention, and uh, a cleaner mouth. And what we're trying to do for our patients at the moment is really get the mouth as clean as possible. Um, the, we have patients who are at risk, such as patients, the elderly patients in poor oral health groups um, who have oral health challenges or um, uh, impaired manual dexterity. What we do is we use the bleaching tray or we provide them a bleaching tray as a therapeutic appliance so for healing the mouth and we call it therapeutic aesthetics and we would give them carbamide peroxide in five percent as a percentage or ten percent and they would wear their um, they would wear the healing tray the therapeutic tray in their mouth for um, all all the way through the night as uh, as a healer to disinfect the mouth those patients who have high caries for tooth decay and root decay, again, that can be used as a special um, reduction for reduction in tooth decay and root decay. Patients, special care patients, again, would benefit from using carbamide peroxide in a bleaching tray called a therapeutic tray. And Lizarchik has published on this in 2010, where they examined the benefits for patients in um, special care facilities. Now, those patients who suffer from xerostomia, again, would benefit from using the hydrogen peroxide low dose and, um, and also using tooth mousse or MI paste into the bleaching tray as a therapeutic tray. 
for those patients who are immunocompromised, again, even just using the um, tooth mousse, the MI paste into a bleaching tray for a few hours would benefit and improve their oral health. So patients, if they are on uh, chemotherapy, would be beneficial for these patients to help um, with the carbamide peroxide. Um, now, COVID virus patients soak the toothbrush in 3% hydrogen peroxide, throw away the toothbrush after the illness. And we know, as we discussed, the virus can stay active in your saliva. So we need to um, offer special care and special help for our patients. What can we be doing now while our dental practices are shutting? or have shut and we're only on a, tri a telephone triage, we can call our patients, especially the elder elderly and the vulnerable. Um, they probably haven't had a phone call the whole day, so they'd be very happy to receive a call from you just to check on how they are. But we have been triaging our patients to help them. And as I said, we've had quite a few patients requesting the um, whitening gel. Now we can talk about that in terms of legislation, but we would supply them because for the benefits of oral health improvement at this time. Um, also, they looked at from the research, they looked at the hydrogen, hydroxyl radicals, which are released from hydrogen peroxide and carbamide peroxide. They react with the bacterial cell membranes um, and they cause bacterial cell death. This is the study from Bentley. And then they did an in vitro study uh, from Yo, looking at the difference between um, chlorhexidine, how it dislodged the oral biofilm, 1% chlorhexidine or 10% um, carbamide peroxide. And they showed that 10% carbamide peroxide was much better at um, dislodging the, cell, the oral biofilm and was much better for uh, biofilm reduction and was more bactericidal. And so what Hayward suggests is that we might do both, give the patients a 30-second rinse with corsidil, followed by using 10% carbamide peroxide in the tray for a high-risk patient, um, especially those with tooth decay. Um, so these are some of the textbooks I've written um, available on Amazon. If you need any further information, um, just let me know. So this is my dental practice. It's quite sad because we are closed. And um, I've we, for the last two years, we've been renovating to get a new practice. Um, we are going to see emergency patients, but it's quite sad at the moment. Uh, we are in contact with daily contact with our team. And I want to say, pay special tribute to my dental team. Um, we miss you. We thank you for all your support. And we hope to see you again soon. We're having our meetings with our dental team on Zoom. And we'll all see you all tomorrow. Here is the beautiful practice that we've worked so hard to build. And at the moment, it's just shut down in lockdown. So let's now talk about whitening for the purpose of improving oral health, but also improving a patient's self-esteem. When we look at the patient's eyes, we look at the whites of the eyes versus the color of the teeth, we can see that in this first picture, the patient's teeth are much more yellow than the whites of the eyes. At the end of treatment, we aim to have improved um, the whitening, but you can see how the um, the patient's self-esteem has improved a lot. So um, we want to look at the discoloration that we see on patients. Now here we have chronological um, white markings on the tooth. And this corresponds with the um, this corresponds with the time this patient had a lot of earaches and toothache, uh, earaches and um, constant throat infections. And as they became hypoxic and ra um, raised temperature, the calcium was taken out of the tooth to fight the infection. And so the, this is the result of um, the patient's chronic um, um, infection. But also this patient was administered amoxyl. And during this time, this is the amoxyl being incorporated into the tooth structure. And here, this patient benefited from whitening, um, and then we did some microabrasion for the patient. So this is a result for a patient after treatment, um, and the patient had extensive uh, fluorosis damage, but the patient was treatment planned for 20 veneers, and um, we were able to whiten sufficiently without needing any further treatment. 
So when we're looking at classification of treatments, not all cases are the same. And so we have a basic case, an intermediate case, and an advanced case. A basic case would be no restorative dentistry required, home bleaching, four to six weeks to achieve a B1 shade. The magic number is B1. And we always want our patients to achieve a B1 shade. Um, the intermediate bleaching would be some restorative dentistry required in combination with two bleaching treatments. And it would be about six to eight weeks to achieve a B1 shade. Advanced bleaching treatments would be complex discoloration in combination with advanced restorative treatments such as dental implant treatment or treatment a patient with prolonged um, sensitivity, existing sensitivity, we would treat treatment and pre-treat them. The way that we would do that, it was we would make bleaching trays for the patient first. We would use a soothing gel, a proprietary soothing gel for the patient, and they would wear that for a week before. So, for example, we would use either Polo Soothe from SDI, which is a combination of potassium nitrate and fluoride, or we would use the Philips product, which is called Relief Gel, which also has um, amorphous calcium phosphate. Or we would use Ultra Ease from OptiDent, which um, can be placed into the patient's bleaching tray and worn either before treatment, after treatment, or instead of treatment, depending on sensitivity. But for a patient who had prolonged sensitivity, we would use them, use that first, and desensitize them for a week before we. Um, before we start whitening. So these are all examples of uh, basic bleaching cases. And um, all of these we treated over the four to six week period using 10% carbamide peroxide. And the is your upper teeth. We always treat the upper teeth using 10% carbamide peroxide. That is our preference. And then we would treat the lower teeth. The reason we treat the upper teeth is that the upper teeth whitening is quicker, faster, less sensitivity, and we have an opportunity to have a color comparison as we are, as we are going along. Um, because it goes quicker on the upper, the patients are normally delighted with the results. And then when they come to do the lower, the lower is a little bit slower and has um, often accompanied, accompanied with more sensitivity. Because the upper has been so easy, they normally tolerate the lower, um, the lower whitening because it can be more sensitive, particularly on the incisal tips of the teeth. So all of these are examples of intermediate treatment. On this particular case, we did home bleaching plus non-vital bleaching. Um, in combination. And so that's why we call it intermediate bleaching treatment, because the treatment would take a little bit longer, um, but still to get a nice result. And that is why um, we should check all that uh, before. Um, we need to discuss with the we need to discuss uh, with the patients what how long the whitening may take. And we need to also discuss this, so the likely outcome. We always underestimate the results so the patient is not um, the patient is not disappointed. But these pace, um, these cases with intermediate bleaching uh, treatments, it may take six to eight weeks or, or could be longer. So we can never guarantee the results of whitening. We need to discuss with them the possibilities and um, the options for treatment and always starting with the most minimal invasive treatment. If you can see on this patient, they have a lot of recession. And normally when we when we would do an examination for the patient, we would spray the three in one, although at the moment we can't use um, the air spray, which generates um, aerosol generating procedures. But um, normally we would spray the air here and ask the patient, is this painful? Is this patient in these cervical areas? Because these days we will often pre-treat those first with a resin modified glass or onomer, such as Reva or Fuji 2, using a light shade prior to treatment, like an A1 shade onto these cervical areas. On this young girl, over here, we treated her over the summer period. She had to travel down from Birmingham because the dentists were concerned about doing the treatment for an under 18 child. So we can talk about this and the controversies. And we hope that when the coronavirus outbreak is sorted and we are all back to the new normal, 
we are planning with the British Dental Bleaching Society to lobby the government for change for the under 18s. And we're hoping that we can ratify the legislation that it's fine to do under 18 whitening. We will talk more about that tonight, but do not be afraid of it. It is fine to do the treatment for the children. So this little girl here, you can see the brown marks on her teeth. And she was being teased at school a lot. And um, it, was her, it was her last few weeks of school. And she came to see me just before the end of year six. Uh, we did the whitening. You can see the beautiful result here. And she could go into school on the last few days of school to show her beautiful white teeth without, she was, uh, without being bullied. And everybody was um, very impressed with the results, especially mum. Mum was really, um, she was really grateful with the outcome of the results. And we recorded her, um, her comments to the mum and to the daughter because we are gathering ev evidence to be able to present this later to change the legislation for the children. So we look at how tooth whitening has changed over the years. Um, it's now actually 30 years since we've been doing the tooth whitening that we do now. Um, and the first paper came out by uh, uh, in um, Van Hayward and Harold Heyman in 1989. So it's 31 years since we've been doing that. And again, we have to say, pay tribute to Dr. Van Hayward and Harold Heyman for their great contribution to science and literature and especially to changing patients' lives in such a simple way using whitening. So patients' expectations have increased a lot. Patients want whiter and whiter teeth. There's now a philosophy of perfection where they want a perfect smile, and that's not always possible. We now know that we can treat more difficult discolorations, and um, but it takes longer. So a basic case, as we discussed, is four to six weeks. And... Uh, cases um, clean can be um, six to eight weeks, eight to ten weeks, or even twelve weeks. Tetracycline may even continue for longer. Um, there's no the age limit for under 18s will be changed, but we can treat them if it's for treatment of disease, and we'll talk about that later. Then, not all whitening is permanent, so it does need top ups from time to time and that we will assess the patient in general to see um, their whitening result. The two-week two treatment is not a two-week treatment. It's just beginning at two weeks. The tray designs have changed a lot, but you want to have a scallop design with no reservoirs. You want a tight-fitting tray, even an aligner, Invisalign aligner, all of those work very well. We've spoken tonight about therapeutic use, and I hope that will be a good take home message for you um, about using the bleaching trays as therapeutic trays, especially during this time when we want our patients to maintain excellent oral health where we are not able to do professional cleanings. This is the way to help them. So you can call your patients, especially those patients who've recently undertaken tooth whitening, and if they the range is left, they can brush their teeth with the carbamide peroxide to improve their oral health and um, reduction in swelling. We want them to have excellent oral health. Or we can discuss whether they need any, any top-up whitening gel for the purpose of improving their oral health at this time. So the techniques are basically using the home, um, the trays, um, and with the introduction of soothers and potassium nitrate and fluoride, we will talk a little bit more about that. Um, the most important thing is the dental examination for whitening. We need to, the key message is that we need to exclude pathology. That is the key message. And so each time a patient is ready to do treatment, we need to see them for an examination to exclude pathology. Obviously, medical history is relevant. Um, the more medication a patient takes, I think there is a link with discoloration of teeth because of dehydration factor. And um, we need to discuss their medical history and the medication that patients take. For example, Roaccutane for acne can cause discoloration, gray discoloration. So all medical history is relevant. Then we need to discuss the dental history and ask about trauma and any um, any associated trauma. What we want to ask our patients is their hopes and aspirations for whitening. 
and for their mouth and for their oral health. And normally a patient will give you a list of six things that they want to improve in their oral health. And we write and note that down because often whitening is the beginning of the journey and then patients will seek further aesthetic treatment. Everything as we know is now put on hold, but I think that afterwards, after we go back to our new normal, there'll be a surge in uptake in treatment of whitening treatment, aesthetic treatments, patients clamoring to get back into the dental surgeries. And hopefully that will help us financially because we're all suffering quite a lot of having to shut our practices down. We need to talk um, about the shade of white that our patients want. Some dentists say that they have difficulty um, doing whitening treatments and they would love to do more whitening treatments. So the one simple measure would be to measure the shade A3 shade tab on every patient. And we ask the patient when we do an examination, not during emergency treatment, but when we're doing an examination, we measure the A3 shade tab. Every patient has their shade taken at their examination. So we can note down their present shade. And that can lead to a discussion about shades and the color of teeth. And they want to see their, um, the shades. If they are A3, what is a lighter shade? And we can look at the various shade guides. Now, one device which is really nice to use is called the Vita Easy Shade. There's a picture of it over here. Um, it's from Vita. There is a special app that you can download called the Vita Assist. And that app um, will help you with a Bluetooth. This machine can go Bluetooth to measure the shade of teeth. It really helps you for crowns as well to measure the shade and is a nice, neat little device to help us measure. And on a new patient, I will use this on the six upper and six lower teeth measuring the shade to see. Then we need to look at pain versus sensitivity, cracks on teeth, bruxism, previous ortho gingival health, Patients with black cracks on their teeth, the, cra the black cracks will not disappear with whitening. These are patients who've previously been smoking and grinding their teeth. And as we know, many patients are stressed at the moment and may be grinding their teeth. Again, the bleaching trays can help as a temporary bite guard because it's a soft night guard. It can help for a short period of time. Some patients who have dehydration lines on their teeth where they have um, a short upper lip and there's a color disparency. That is these kind of questions we need to look at and explain to patients what's realistic and what's not. Um, periapical pathology is the most key thing that we want to see when we are excluding pathology. We want to see whether there are any undetected periapical lesions and how we can um, assess that. The way that we would assess it is radiological tests, um, and we would take a periapical radiograph. The rule is that any discolored tooth needs a periapical radiograph because you want to see whether there's any widening or irritation or periapical lesions. We want to carry out our um, we want to carry out vitality testing, percussion and percussion, per, um, palpation. But we really want to know the vitality of the nerves because in whitening, this is the only treatment that we put directly into the nerves of every single tooth. And the whitening gel goes inside the nerves within five to 10 minutes of gel application. So on a patient who has pre -sensit um, existing sensitivity, we can apply, we would give the patients the desensitizing toothpaste. And either we would use Novamine, Arginine, uh, arginine or Durafat. The Novamine is the um, Sensodyne range, as well as arginine is the Colgate range or Durafat, and they can um, brush with the toothpaste for two weeks prior to whitening, and that often will have a, a very um, effective response in reduction of sensitivity. And these are studies that Professor Van Hayward has undertaken and um, shown that just brushing for two weeks with Sensodyne can make a significant difference in reduction of sensitivity. Then we would give the patient their bleaching tray and they would apply the soothing gels into the tray for a week before they started. Um, extensive treatment, maybe gingival grafting afterwards or before treatment. Sometimes you would just assess and modify the toothbrushing technique. Patients may be using a, a toothbrush which is too hard and that is causing the um, gingival recession and sensitivity. Particularly if patients have got a brand new, brand new electric toothbrush, they may be brushing too hard and that is why they have existing sensitivity.
So as we mentioned, sometimes we would do restorative treatment where we would do a resin-modified glass onoma, and we'd cover over the exposed dentine prior to undertaking the whitening. So we asked the patients four questions. First of all, do you have any cold sensitivity? Do you have any sweet sensitivity? Do you have any, any sensitivity to heat? Pain on biting and sensitivity to cold. So um, this week I spoke to my sister who was in self-isolation in New Zealand. And she said to me she was suffering with sensitivity. And as we know, all the dental practices are closed. And um, it was sensitive to, her tooth was sensitive to heat. And it was relieved by cold. And that is a warning sign that there's a possible pulpitis. But we said to her, use the bleaching tray with some um, ACP tooth mousse, an MI paste, into the bleaching tray for an hour a day. And luckily, that was able to combat her sensitivity. So these questions, what we really want to know is, um, is there any pulpitis or is it just sensitivity or a toothache? If there's sweet sensitivity, that normally means there's caries and that can be dealt with uh, temporarily first before we would start treatment. In the, in the current situation where we are only under, uh, undertaking emergency treatment, we can use a product called SDF, silver diamine fluoride. We're about to publish on that. Um, and that can significantly help to place over directly over a, uh, an ex, um, a large uh, cavity to use as a temporary filling to stop decay. You can have a look. We will do a, another webinar about that another time. Pain on biting and sensitivity to cold means that there's a crack in the tooth. So we need to assess the patient for cracks and treat those prior to treat um, to becoming to assessing the treatment. Now, this particular patient, she's a new patient. She attended the surgery. She wanted to whiten her teeth. She'd previously completed ortho, and she was concerned that the diastema was opening up between her two front teeth. As you can see here, um, here's the diastema, but what you can also see on this radiograph is there's been massive resorption of the roots. And when we have this for the patient, it's we call it the moment of truth because we have to discuss what we see on the radiograph, but we also have to discuss the possibility that we don't know how long the teeth will last and um, that the patient may need implants rather than just tooth whitening. But it's very important for us post-ortho to take radiographs prior to whitening so we can see um, if there's been any pulp changes or any resorption that has taken place. Um, here is another situation where a patient, um, this is the clinical situation over here. Patient had power whitening first, then had some home whitening. Um, the power whitening was fine. And on the third day um, after doing home whitening, they were in pain. You can see there's some cracks on the tooth. Can you notice that there's only a little bit of um, discoloration between the two teeth? But this tooth has been obviously previously traumatized in some way from grinding or bruxing. But when you look at the radiograph over here, you can see a periapical lesion, quite large. The dentist took an x-ray when the patient reported in pain. But what the dentist should have done is taken an x-ray prior to start whitening to be able to determine these and do the appropriate treatment at the appropriate time prior to commencing any whitening treatment. So I'm happy for you to take a photo of the slide. This is a summary of discoloration that patients are experiencing. We need to look at extrinsic factors, intrinsic factors. Um, for example, patients who have a lot of fried food, the oil molecule can cause browning of the, of the teeth. And so we need to have a discussion about diet. Um, also about the tea. Tea is more staining than coffee, red wine, the amount of tea and coffee they drink, which antibiotics they've taken in the past, which, take, which they are taking now. So antibiotics have either, if the patient is ill, an extrinsic effect or an intrinsic effect. The extrinsic effect the, um, that can be removed with a prophylaxis, but intrinsically, for example, tetracycline and amoxicillin incorporated into the tooth structure and that can cause a permanent uh, discoloration. Patients with poor oral hygiene have got more extrinsic stain. And this is from my colleague, uh, Professor Jean-Pierre Attal in Paris. His research showed that dairy, consumption of dairy in young children causes the black staining that you see on kids' teeth, especially palatally on the uh, primary, primary molars.
um, and that's related to dairy. Intrinsically, where there's been any internal bleeding or liver disease, kidney disease, any trauma will cause intrinsic discolorations. We mentioned to you about roaccutane and minocycline and tetracycline all causing internal discoloration. Patients who take a lot of iron tablets may have gray staining on their teeth and um, copper and even those patients who swim a lot can cause um, discolorations. This called swimming pool discoloration. Other factors, uh, we will talk about white spots and bisphenol A shortly. So this patient had the same problem with with the white spots being incorporated, we mentioned earlier that they had the infections, chronic um, ear infections and throat infections as a young child, leading to antibody ad antibiotic administration, and here it is being placed. Um, some patients who have um, amalgam fillings, can you see here, this is where the occlusal amalgams are. And the patients reported that when they take the bleaching tray out, there's a little black stain, and that is due to the amalgam. So um, we do know that a little bit more uh, mercury is released during whitening, and this is relevant for patients who are trying to fall pregnant, having fertility treatment. But of course, as you know, um, there's no whitening to be undertaken for pregnant women and for nursing women, for nursing mothers. So let's talk about what shade of white we want. There are many different shades and often many patients want to have the whitest shade. This is the shade guide which has been developed by um, Dr. Rada Paravina from the University of Texas. He, uh, he carefully analyzed the value shades and this is the shade guide. It's called the Bleaching 3D Master and these are the different levels of shades that we can lighten to and this is a scientific measure for those wishing to do research on whitening. Then there's a new shade which has been documented um, called Love Island White. And um, many of the contestants over here, this is in the last series, have a super white shade. Some, This one has Love Island Blue, which is a completely different shade. And we need to ask our patients what shade of white they are trying to achieve. This shade is not on the natural shade guide, but um, many patients do wish to have that shade guide because of the contestants um, div, um, showing this extra white shade. Some people um, want to have such white teeth that they may need to have veneers, but we always try and encourage our patients first to have whitening because we, uh, the benefits of whitening is it's non, um, it's minimal invasive, it's non-destructive, um, non it preserves the enamel and preserves the oral health as well. So those are the benefits. Now let's look at tetracycline staining. Tetracycline staining, as we mentioned, is incorporated. The tetracycline molecule is incorporated into the dentine of the tooth. And um, that discoloration is deeply embedded inside the dentine. And so it takes a long time to get rid of the discoloration. Um, and this patient has type 1 discoloration, tetracycline over here in this area. There is a yellow orange band on the necks of the teeth. That's how we can tell that it is tetracycline staining. This patient had more severe type 2 tetracycline. Again, when we discuss with the patients, we say to them, we're really not sure how long um, how long it's going to take. So we expect it's going to be three, six, nine, or 12 months. Um, and the patients are delighted within um, six weeks that we've managed to achieve this kind of shade. The first thing is, as we mentioned, sensitivity management and sensitivity reduction. This patient needed some glossoonoma restorations in these areas here to be able to, um, and then we made the bleaching tray. Now this patient, um, we also have to say thank you to some of the celebrities who've posted about their tetracycline discoloration on Instagram and on Facebook. And that led to a lot of patients seeking treatment for their tetracycline discoloration. And here, what we have done for this patient, can you see the extreme banding on the teeth? On, this, on the banding here, we don't know whether we can improve the banding. But what we do know is that we can try our best. Can you see on the necks of the teeth, the orange stain? 
these necks tell us that this is tetracycline staining. We cannot guarantee to um, improve that orange discoloration. We cannot guarantee that the banding is going to go away, but we do know that we can try to achieve a little bit of improvement. And sometimes just with a little bit improvement with this patient, we worked with him for four months. Actually, it was quicker, about three months. First, we whiten the upper teeth and then we whitened the lower teeth. But we did plan to do some cosmetic contouring, which we've done over here, and some bonding at the same time. So here is his final results. When we recorded him, he actually burst out crying at the end of treatment. Not because he didn't cry because of the price, but he cr he cried at the end of treatment to see what a simple a, um, a simple way we could achieve um, a beautiful smile for him. So we contoured, we um, adjusted the occlusion a little bit, we placed glass onoma restorations in these areas over here. Um, we used Reva shade A1 first, and then we did the whitening and contoured and shaped these areas and bonded that. And you can see a nice, simple improvement. So they looked at where does the bleaching actually occur? Does it occur in the enamel or does it occur in the dentine? We used to think that the dentine had to be lightened, but now we know that the enamel is also lightened. If you look at the study, this is from Zoma, and Zoma showed that actually the enamel changes and you get changes in the um, opacity. The enamel becomes more opaque. Um, and that's really important post whitening to do when we're going to do bondings because we'll be using new composite materials. There is a, a lovely new composite material called Composite from Style Italiano available from Optident. And we will be doing a webinar about that on the 21st of May, please diarize that, and that is through dentinal tubules. And we're going to take you through a case where we did whitening plus bonding. We're going to show you the improvements that we can do post whitening with the new composites that are available. There are also composites from Aura. Aura has um, SDI has a, a shade called DB shade, which is the bleaching shade, as well as Ecocyte. That's a new composite from DMG. They have enamel bleach shade, enamel light shade, and they're brilliant post whitening. Now, um, for this patient, she came to see me. She was crying. Um, she was desperate to have these crowns changed but really she needed to do some whitening as well. Um, if you look at the radiograph over here, you can see not perfect endo with some very large unusual posts inside. But so what we decided to do was provisionalize her first, then we did the whitening. With these recession areas here and here, we placed resin modified glass onomas to treat those first, and then we put provisionals, then we did whitening. Then we came back afterwards to do to place the uh, the final crowns. Here is the Vita shade eye, measuring the shade. This is so helpful to know and to discuss with the technician to show them the shades that we want to try and achieve for this patient. These were the stump shades. You can also do whitening in the stump. You can make provisional crowns and put 10% carbamide peroxide in the provisional crown into the root area. Um, and then you can whiten the stump as well. So here is the final improvement. Here we place the resin modified glass onoma restorations here, and this is the final result. On this patient, on this side, this patient had MIH plus damage, and we will talk a little bit now about, uh, about MIH um, shortly afterwards. There, um, first of all, we want to talk about how does whitening work? And the way that whitening works is it's the hydrogen peroxide breaks down into water and oxygen and is the oxygen inside that um, helps to whiten and oxidize the enamel and the dentine. As we discussed within five minutes, the whitening gel is inside the nerve and we want to make sure that the nerves are absolutely fine prior to undertaking whitening treatment. So if you want to take a photo of this, these are the current whitening products that are available on the market. Um, we have 3%, 5%, 10%, and 16%. Those are the products that we currently use. 3% carbamide peroxide is used as a toothpaste with a whitening gel. And again, at this particular time, with a virus outbreak, this is a good toothpaste to use so that um, we can improve oral health at the same time. 
Then we have Novon Mild, which is the 5% carbamide peroxide. It has a special soother inside called sodium tripolyphosphatase. And this is the research published from the Eastman from Dr. Alva McDonald. And um, what we would do for this patient, we would use this specifically for patients who um, have sensitivity, medical histories, or children. Um, we would start with 5%. Now, as we discussed, if we want to improve oral health, we would use 5% to improve oral health. And um, that's very effective. Um, and Optident have told me they do have a two month supply available, so you can give them a call. But we would use this in certain situations. I'm going to talk about that now. 10% carbamide peroxide is the standard products, and those are Polar Night, Opalescence PF, Night White by Philips, the Boutique Whitening. The cheek whitening has 10% and a 16% version. I always encourage dentists to use 10% first, first 5% for sensitivity, then 10% and then 16%. 16% would be used for um, in polar night opalescence PF for non-vital teeth and for patients who are not sensitive to 10%, we would use that for um, non-vital teeth, sclerose teeth and patients um, who have tetracycline staining. Here is our article, which I mentioned. Please download that off, our, uh, off the website. So 5% would be used for younger patients, medically compromised patients, patients with existing sensitivity, recessions patients with extreme sensitivity, or patients who've tried other whitening gels but have been too sensitive to use that. So there is a big need for a low-dose 5% carbamide peroxide, specifically for oral health treatments at the moment. Um, this young patient had a liver transplant at the age of four years old, and you can see there's the green discoloration from the bilirubin and from the um, liver enzymes. Um, and so you can see when the teeth erupted, the premolars didn't have that discoloration. And she was about to go into high school, so we started her on 5% carbamide peroxide on the upper teeth and when we had lightened that the mother supervised she was 11 she was 12 years old and then we did the lower teeth you can see there is a massive improvement for this child so she feels good about herself going into high school this particular patient has got um, pemphigus so she has a, a, a bullous disease which is the teeth are, the mouth is tender so we used five percent carbamide peroxide for her to improve her oral health as well and you can see the um, improvements that we were able to achieve we took her slowly on the journey using five percent carbamide peroxide first to assess that she had no, no sensitivity and then we changed it to ten percent these are the products using um, hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide is effective, especially effective um, quickly. So all the oxygen is released over half an hour when you apply the carb the hydrogen peroxide only. So there are um, the tray white extreme, there are the um, strips as well. But the main product, we cannot use more than 6% hydrogen peroxide in the um, bleaching trays um, in the current legislation. So we can use all these products listed over here, but all of them are only effective for half an hour to 45 minutes. That's when all the oxygen is released. We cannot use opalescent boots. We can only use 6% and those are good for top ups, but um, the main treatments, we would still use 10% carbamide peroxide. Now, power bleaching has had a lot of controversy um, and many um, initially when it came out, we thought it was the only way of doing treatment. We subsequently discovered that the bleaching trays are much more effective. But if you are going to use the um, chase side treatment, there are ways of making it more effective. There is a, a 6% hydrogen peroxide. And what happens is that you can use that. Um, you, can heat up the, you can heat up the gel prior to administration. You can use a compressed bleaching technique where you take a um, piece of cling film and you wrap it over the teeth or you could use um, the compressed bleaching technique where you use the patient's bleaching trays at the chair side. There is a new product called Blank One which has 16% carbamide peroxide as a chair side treatment. It's brilliant for a 10-minute treatment post high gene treatment and that's when we use that. So this is called assisted bleaching technique where you would use a piece of cling film to compress the whitening gel into the teeth. And we need to make sure that we still isolate, even though we're using 6% hydrogen peroxide, we need to still isolate the teeth. 
Sometimes post-operative, you can get gingival irritation, soft tissue irritation, transient thermal sensitivity, or dehydration. So you do need to be careful, and you need to always make sure that you use the technique, um, the correct technique, and that you show care and consideration to patients. If you should have a um, um, a, a tissue blanching or an ulceration, you need to take a wet cotton wool roll. First of all, if during power bleaching, if the patient says they feel any sensitivity or tingling or burning, you need to stop the procedure, take off the light codam and assess whether or not there's been some irritation. You take your wet cotton wool roll, you hold it in place, and slowly the white mark will change to a red mark and then go on to back to normal health. Um, and you want to catch these lesions early. Nowadays, with using 6%, you would hardly have any irritation or soft tissue irritation during that. I'd now like to move on and talk about non-vital teeth. Um, again, if you have any questions, you can email, you can uh, message me. The best way is on Instagram. Just go to Greenwall Dental and um, set, set me a question. I'm happy to have a discussion afterwards because they're often, with bleaching, there are a lot of questions. Um, we will run a seminar with Dr. Tariq Bashir. And um, please go on to the um, Scottish Dental Study Group onto Facebook and message him. We will be doing um, sessions on ICON and on um, whitening. We have been doing quite a few seminars in Glasgow and they've been quite successful. I've really enjoyed meeting all the dentists and we always have a lot of fun when we do them. Now let's talk about single tooth whitening. Single tooth whitening we've published on, again, go onto my website, go to greenwell.com and download the single, um, single tooth whitening. We published, it was a 10 page article in the BDJ last year on the technique of doing single tooth whitening. Normally we would recommend that you um, first treat the dark tooth. So this tooth is vital, these two are non-vital. We treat the darkest tooth first, and we make a segmental bleaching tray and then we whiten the dark tooth first and then as we're about to um, bleach all the teeth we will change over to a full bleaching tray. We'll bleach the upper teeth first until everything was matching nicely and then we will bleach the lower teeth. So let's have a look at some examples. This particular patient, look at the radiograph. Can you see the radiograph here? That's this tooth. Um, there's pulp obliteration, the pulp canal obliteration. We can hardly see the pulp. So this tooth is still vital. When you put your electric pulp tester on, you will notice that it's still vital. It's the last rung on the dial. So you really don't need to do any um, exploratory endo. Do not even think of doing it. It's impossible. And you need to make sure that um, the patient has no symptoms. So they should be symptom free. They should have um, um, no tapping, no palpation, no uh, tenderness around the area at all. Um, and then you can make a segmental bleaching tray first and then you lighten the dark teeth. That can take up to six weeks to lighten. And then um, we, after that, we make a full bleaching tray. So this patient needs two bleaching two bleaching trays to be made, um, a sectional bleaching tray and a full upper tray, and then a lower bleaching tray. You need to cost that into your procedure. So this is the bleaching tray. And here we would cut back. This is the dark tooth. We'd cut back the tooth on either side from the buckle. So we have a segmental bleaching tray. Here is another example of a patient where we made a segmental bleaching tray. We bleached the dark tooth first, and then we swapped over to a full arch bleaching tray. So here is the tooth before, here's the segmental bleaching tray, there is the full arch bleaching tray, and here is the final result. You'll see it's a really nice natural result. The patient um, had trauma to the tooth, the tooth was still vital, she was offered a crown, she said no, I'll wait until the technology, until the science improves. And we were able to do this in a minimal invasive way. This shows the pulp chamber being obliterated during the trauma, and um, the whitening is possible, but it will take, it can take six weeks to do the whitening. So you need to tell the patients to prepare. 
um, that it will take that period of time. Then we would do, um, let's talk about non-vital bleaching options and the European legislation. We can only use 10%, 16% and 6% hydrogen peroxide. So now that we've discussed that, um, let's look at the new classification. So there's either the sealed in technique, the outside in, outside inside open technique or the outside inside closed. Those are the different uh, um, terminologies that we use these days. We make a bleaching tray for the labial surface and we would seal in 16% carbamide peroxide inside. And with a bleaching tray, would the tooth would bleach from the inside or the outside. Or you can use the outside inside where you leave the access cavity open and the patient applies the 16% carbamide peroxide to the back of the access cavity every two hours. As you start the procedure on a Friday afternoon and bring the patient back on Monday morning to seal the access cavity. These days, we cannot use any, um, we cannot use sodium perborate in combination with hydrogen peroxide. By using those two products, they are synergistic, and that's like using 50% hydrogen peroxide inside an already weakened non-vital tooth. So we would um, rather use 16% carbamide peroxide as the main ingredient. Sodium perborate has also been banned in Europe, and it is not possible to use this product anymore. So here in this example of a patient where we started with the dark tooth first, this was post-ortho, patient needed endo um, during the ortho treatment. And so we wiped internally, we redid the endo, and we'll talk a little bit about that. And then we whitened, and that's the final results all the way through. 16% sealed inside the axis cavity. This has changed every two weeks. And the patient bleaches from the inside and the outside. Plus, we use the special bleaching tray, the segmental bleaching tray, at the same time. So I'd like you to take a photo of the slide. Basically, we need to look at all the options that we need to discuss with patients when we are treatment planning. We need to do the assessment on the history and trauma because patients which are traumatized, you've had trauma, there may be more resorption possible. And the, the way that we use our new techniques, it's very safe and they get minimal resorption, but trauma, previous severe trauma can lead to resorption as you know. We need to make sure there's no pain and do a clinical evaluation, tapping, pressure, palpation, and check when the endo was lost, when the root canal was done. We need to look at the radiograph. We need to see, is there lesion? Is there no lesion? What is the endo like? Is it well condensed? Um, we need to look at the crown root ratio. So we have a lot of decisions to make when we are planning non-vital bleaching. That means that we need to do consultation, x-rays, diagnosis, treatment planning. Sometimes we need to redo the root canal, wait a month to settle and make impressions for bleaching tray. Then we need to prepare a barrier and um, we would have the first stage whitening treatment and then change it and change it until we were happy with the final restoration. How long does this take? Actually, it can take up to the, these, all these appointments could be six hours. That means it's six hours of your clinical time. So you need to treatment plan and you need to cost that out appropriately. So when it comes to making the barrier, we would, the barrier needs to be two millimeters below the CEJ and the barrier needs to be two millimeters in thickness. And so we need to prepare this. Normally we would measure with our Gates Glidden and drill um, 10 millimeters for the clinical crown, then two millimeters. So when we are prepping, it's like prepping 14 millimeters, um, like you were prepping a post when you prepare the barrier. And we would use a resin modified glass onomer as the barrier and make sure that it follows the shape of the dentinal tubules. So all this, what we need to discuss for every patient, we need to have a treatment planning discussion, case dis uh, presentation, um, what are the benefits, what are the options, what are the risks, and the consent for patient, all these need to be discussed. So during this time of lockdown, when we're talking about improving our, um, our dental knowledge, we should also make plans for future going forward and improve our techniques and our paperwork and admin. We can be doing all that during this uh, time of lockdown so that when we go back to, to treating patients, we are better, more organized, more efficient. We've got good communication with our teams, but I think that the cost of operation, cost of dentistry is going to go up because of the enhanced um, PPE that we are going to need to use going Going forward. So when you look at this endo, we can see 
it's a little bit questionable. Um, is it a good endo? Some people say it's good. Some people say it needs improvement, but there is an irritation around here. And it looks like there's a secondary canal over here where we need to, um, we may need to redo this endo, which is what we did. And if you look here, um, we can see an area lesion here. Then we have, when we um, exploratory file, we can see there's a definite lesion here. Here is the final outcome. This treatment was undertaken by Dr. Jude Ferreira, who's the endodontist in our multi-specialty practice. And um, this is a nice, um, nice well-condensed endo. Here is the barrier, which he prepared. This is the glass onomer. And here is the space for the um, bleaching gel inside. And then we would put the bleaching gel inside and um, pack it with PTFE and again, a resin modified glass onomer. This is one of the papers that we produced on Professor with, uh, together with Professor Yemen Lee about safety of whitening. Please download this off my website. And it discusses the safety of hydrogen peroxide and the efficiency and the effectiveness of the hydrogen peroxide. So in terms of measuring for the barrier, you would take your Gates Glidden drill and measure, we've said 14 millimeters, and you put the stopper to 14 millimeters. You would prepare it and place it, remove the GP. When you go into the access cavity, open and clean out any debris in the access cavity. Then you would place your glossa onoma. Then you would place your 16% um, carbamide peroxide with a Teflon tape and the glass onoma is placed over it. Check the occlusion and ask the patient to come back after two weeks to review the situation. Here is the design of the barrier. It should be a bobsleigh design to follow the way um, of, the um, of the odontoblasts and the dentinal tubules in this area. What we normally do when we are packing the 16% um, carbamide peroxide is we would change the tip and we change it to a, a finer tip and bend it so we can place this directly into the axis cavity and we backfill. And we prepare the PTFE in advance so that we have it just neatly to be able to compact it into the tooth. And then we would change the dressings every two weeks. Now, Professor Van Hayward has recommended that sometimes we don't even need to change the dressings. And what we would do, do is just place the um, carbamide peroxide um, just buckly and um, labelly, just change that without internal dressing change. So that is a new technique, again, reviewing the patients. When we would review the patient and we did whitening, let's say five years later, we never go back into the access cavity. We always would whiten from the label surface. So we spoke about afterwards, what would we do? And we would place either a glass onoma composite or resin modified glass um, um, resin modified glossa onoma. These are the three options, but actually, when you are bleaching a tooth, there's a high amount of oxygen inside and that decreases your enamel bond strength by 20%. So actually, immediately after doing any form of whitening, we should wait two weeks before we do any bonding. But immediately after doing non vital bleaching, we'd place a resin modified glossa onoma as your final restoration or a chemically cleared glossa onoma. So we're going to change tack now and we're going to talk a little bit about whitening um, and white spots. And these are our options and our choices. We're going to look at white spots because white spots are increasing on our patient's teeth that are developing. There's a now a 20 to 40 percent increase in the children's teeth that are developing. And this is due to many factors. Um, but because of these white spots, we need to now um, have a treatment protocol for the children, which does involve doing whitening. Um, some of the patients have MIH, molar incisor hypermineralization, and the enamel is, um, has 20% less mineral content, and there's 15% more protein content. And these need special treatments. But this particular patient had defects on the teeth, and we were able to whiten. Um, and then we did microabrasion and resin infiltration to take them away with a little bit of composite bonding over the defects as well. So again, colleagues, I hope you're enjoying this presentation and this webinar. And we do want to say thank you. We're not finished yet, but I just want to, I do want to say thank you to Clive and to, for Tariq for organizing this. 
um, it's very important that we can relay this in, in, important information to our dental colleagues. These are the all the reasons when whitening is appropriate for under 18s. And the General Dental Council outlined that if you are treating disease, so if you are treating disease, this is when it's the most important. So I've listed here the 10 categories when it's disease appropriate and listing when you can treat the children with, um, with whitening for white spots. So we've just discussed non-vital teeth plus development of opaque white spots and marks, brown or yellow markings on the anterior teeth, Merlin's Heiser hypermineralization, often that will need extensive restorative treatment first, but there's six different categories of MIH which we can look at. There's a really good website called the D3 group, so look at that on the MIH. Fluorosis, intrinsic discoloration due to antibiotics, systemic disease, genetic diseases, post-author white spots, and any discoloration affecting the quality of life of the child. And as we know, mental health, um, there's quite a serious mental health issue. And if we can if we can help these children to achieve whitening in a simple way, then we can do that. And these are the specific conditions when we would treat under 18s. I'm not concerned about treating them. I think it's the right thing to do if the child is suffering and being bullied at school, then absolutely it's the right thing to do. Here is a paper which was downloaded. Um, it's the most downloaded article of 2018. It's called by Almulian. And it lists the different categories of MIH. This is one of my patients who had MIH, and you, show, you can see the enamel um, just disintegrating and the dentine breaking down. So one of the treatment options is to actually extract, at the age of nine, extract the sixes so the sevens can erupt through without any problems. But we do need to look at all the enamel and also plan for fissure sealant, uh, and that's really important um, to have a look at. Here are the list of, um, again, take a photo of this, guys, the um, 100 causes of MIH and white spots on teeth. This particular patient, she had trauma in the primary dentition, which led to the discoloration here. So we were able to whiten this out. It took eight weeks to whiten. We, she did have defects on the enamel where we were going to bond, but she, um, she was delighted with the result. She didn't want to have any further treatment. So when we're looking at the causes and the etiology of the white marks, there's now up to 100 reasons why you get the white spots. It's one in six patients do have these white marks. So it's really a due to medical history. Anything that happens prenatally, uh, perinatally, or postnatally. If there's been exposure to chemicals, bisphenol A is a very, um, very common chemical in plastic. Um, so even up to the children had the pacifiers, um, they were, there was um, plastic in the pacifiers. So we want to try and eliminate bisphenol A from any usage and also in the plastic water bottles. So prenatally, po um, perinatally, anything that happens during the birth. So premature um, children who are born twins often have more white spots. Any hospital um, admissions, medications, interventions may cause white spots on the tooth. Any acute or chronic illnesses, oxygen starvation is where the problem occurs and the, um, any calcium metabolic diseases. So postnatally, anything that happens up to the ch um, first three years of the child's life, childhood fever, as we discussed, and this is the reasons why they get white marks on the teeth. So it's up to us to look at the etiology to discuss that with patients when we're talking. This patient has fluorosis stains on the teeth, and um, she's 11 year old prior to whitening, prior to ortho. But you see, after three weeks, you still get orange discoloration, which is why we need to tell the patient that we need to go for three, six, nine, um, three or six months. Normally, this would be sorted out within three months, but the mom needs to supervise the whitening treatments. You may think that the children are more sensitive, but they actually are not. The large pups are able to manage this. So when we look at the white lesions in the dental history, we want to look at the depth of the lesion, the size and the shape of the lesion, whether it's superficial, mixed or deep. So we do the pretreatment first, which is bleaching, and then we would look at microabrasion, um, sandblasting or the aqua care using um, the silk material, or we would do icon, but we would often, depending if the enamel surface or the label surface was um, uh, rough, we would use microabrasion to smooth the surface, or then we would do the icon treatment. 
and we will talk a little bit more about that. This is the microabrasion treatment where we use 6% hydrochloric acid onto the surface of the teeth. And this is the open luster paste, and that's available from OptiDent. If you twist their arms nicely, I'm sure they will send you a sample of the open luster material. Um, Oh, the, here it is. And basically, microabrasion is a technique whereby a superficial, um, a microscopic layer of the enamel is superficial, simultaneously abraded and eroded at the same time, leaving a perfectly intact enamel surface, which is smooth and lustrous. This is the research over here, which shows 20 year follow up of the research showing that it is an effective technique. The um, microabrasion, sorry, I have a little visitor. Um, the microabrasion really helps um, to smooth any surface discoloration plus uh, patients with fluorosis as well it's excellent as a fluorosis treatment um, so these are the different um, hydrochloric acid concentrations we have six percent which is the open luster paste and that's from optident we have ten percent hydrochloric acid which is the prima product and we have 15 percent hydrochloric acid is from dmg and that is for the resin infiltration as we discussed we do resin infiltration hands-on treatments in glasgow with tariq so please speak to him about that and i'm sure we'll do a webinar hands-on um, and, and to do something in this time of lockdown, we'll be able to do something for the treatment. Um, I haven't shown any videos tonight, but um, there are videos on my YouTube. Go to Linda Greenwell YouTube channel and you can see the icon video uh, live. Here is a child who suffered from MIH and had extreme sensitivity. And the way we knew that is they um, would have their hand in front of their mouth, really worried. Um, even breathing in was super sensitive and the teeth are called their cheese-like molars. So the way that we could tell that is that they're super sensitive, the um, enamel and the dentine is just sloughing off the teeth and very soft. And we need to have an action plan very quickly. We need to counsel the parents and counsel the patients as to um, what has happened, what is the long term and how we can uh, plan for the future treatment for the patient. So these are both MIH patients where they had quite severe markings on the teeth. And both of these were treated with whitening, followed by ICON resin infiltration. ICON resin infiltration uses 15% hydrochloric acid first onto the surface of the teeth for 15, for um, two minutes. The etching is onto the tooth. Then we would place alcohol as a gel, sorry, alcohol alcohol to uh, as a liquid to drip onto the surface of the teeth to see whether we're successful to change the refractix and then we would place the resin on the teeth which is a tegma resin so both of these were treated with icon resin infiltration and i'm sure you'll agree it's a nice minimal result um, in a simple way so here Etch, this is icon etch onto the tooth, 15% hydrochloric acid. Can you see the bubbles when it into the air bubble inside as the dish penetrates into the porous, porosity and open up, opens up the pore more, uh, the pores of the tooth. Here is the alcohol being dripped onto the tooth for 30 seconds. And after that, we check and see whether we've been effective. If we're effective, we can go straight on to resin infiltration. And here is the tegma resin being placed onto the tooth. And that um, is placed on for three minutes. After three minutes, we massage it in the tooth. We would then um, light cure, floss first to make sure that the, the, et, the uh, resin didn't get stuck between the teeth. Now, um, here we did whitening and then we did icon. Here's a beautiful improved look at the canines, improved results. We went from an A3.5 to a B1 shade. Here are the defects of the, of the molars. Do not ignore this and please have a protocol for fissure sealant to protect these. Fissure sealants are very underutilized in dentistry, but we should be looking at this. This will need to have treatment before the enamel and the dentine start sloughing away. This needs active protective treatment on the teeth. So here we are sandblasting because the sandblasting just roughens up the surface to be able to um, achieve the, here's the microabrasion paste placed first and massaged into the tooth. Then we would rehydrate and carry on this procedure for about um, 
15 minutes um, etching and um, well, etching using the microabrasion paste and um, polishing the surface of the tooth. And at the end, we would use um, ACP onto the tooth to polish the surface of the teeth. And here is the result for the patient. Um, at the end, we did the uh, little bit of bonding over the tooth as we discussed. With this patient who has fluorosis stain, we did whitening first, then we did microabrasion. Here is the microabrasion paste onto the teeth and we polish in afterwards the MI paste onto the surface of the teeth. Um, and here is the before and after result. You can see the amazing improvement and how shiny the teeth are afterwards. That's from microabrasion. So when we're looking to come to icon treatment now, there are different ways of managing. If we have a small fleck, we can go onto the label surface and the label surface is intact. We would do whitening followed by microabrasion and resin infiltration. Or we can skip the microabrasion and go straight into the resin infiltration. Or if we have a large opacity, we may want to do four sessions where we would do first the whitening, then we wait two weeks, then we do resin infiltration. With the resin infiltration, we would use sandblasting and etching. Sandblast etch, and we do that for over four sessions. Up, you can go up to seven sessions doing sandblasting and etching, all the way penetrating deeper into the white lesion. And when we'd completed this and we were happy, the result, we'd go straight in to the resin infiltration to eradicate the white mark. And here is a list of the treatment protocol that we would do. If it was even a bigger lesion, we would use a fast hand piece to gently score the surface of the tooth and then place a, um, enamel composite resin. This is from Dr. Jean-Pierre Attal. These are the three um, different syringes. You have the etch, which is the Icon Edge, 15% hydrochloric acid. This is the, um, the ethanol called the Icon Dry, and we would place this for two minutes onto the surface of the tooth. Then we would use Icon Dry to check and to gently onto the surface of the tooth. We would do etching and, dry, um, and checking until we were happy, and then we would go in. So as mentioned, we can go up to four times using the etching and the alcohol and the sandblasting to go deeper into a deep lesion. So these are simple cases where we have managed to um, do whitening plus icon in a simple way on a mature patient in a very simple way to eradicate this. This patient had more extensive white marks, and we were able to eradicate this with whitening and icon. And this is a three-year follow-up. I was very excited to see this result because I realized then the beauty of doing icon resin, that it can manage to eradicate these marks in a minimal invasive way. So if you haven't tried it, give it a try. Um, speak to the DMG rep, um, Rachel, and the DMG people, and um, you can learn a lot about ICON. It has a great, um, it is a great place in aesthetic dentistry. On this particular patient, she has yellow marks and white marks. The yellow marks are due to old composite that was left on the tooth post author. So when you do this, do not immediately um, take these composite marks off or first, first do the treatment plan discussion with the patient, the understanding that the treatment is whitening, icon, um, and may need some composite bonding. It's all three treatments at the same time. And then you can go ahead prior to making the bleaching trays, remove the composite with a Sofplex disc. So we are just about coming towards the end. What I'd like to talk about now is um, whitening and problems and associated management of sensitivity. So this particular patient, can you see her amalgams are quite stained? She came to see me and she was um, undertaking fertility treatment and she was trying to uh, or do a lot of whitening. We know from the research studies, the early studies came out in 1991 showing that sometimes mercury, more mercury is released from fillings during whitening. Then this needs a discussion only relevant if the patient is trying to fall pregnant or is having fertility treatment. But we do know about this and we need to manage patients' expectations about that. We know that amalgam stain will not come out um, during whitening, and that's clear what we explain to patients, risks and benefits and what will happen and what will not happen. And only after completion of treatment and after this lady have a, had a, 
beautiful, healthy baby who's now four years old, gorgeous baby. Only then were we able to remove the old amalgams. Because as you know, when you drill out mercury, when you drill out the fillings, that when is when you get exposed to the most mercury. So rather wait, let the patient have a healthy baby before undertaking any changes of amalgam restorations. So now let's talk about management of sensitivity. Because sensitivity, up to 85% of patients can have sensitivity during bleaching. So the first stage is we want to prevent it. And we remember we spoke about the four questions when we would ask the patient sensitivity to heat, sweet, pain on biting, or sensitivity to cold. And all of this would help us um, understand the nature of the patient's sensitivity. We want to prevent that first. Then we would do any treatment that was necessary. We spoke about the um, desensitizing toothpaste, or we would use a product called Hurry Seal. And Hurry Seal is available from um, www.stopsensitivity.com um, and from Dental Directory. Um, and we use the Hurry Seal, we place it, you drip it onto the surface of the cervical exposed area, and that can solve it. Or you can use a dentin bonding agent. And then you want to help the patient self manage the problem. So um, these are some of the options available. We also speak about the D3 rule. The D3 rule means that there's maximum saturation of oxygen inside the tooth on the third day. So we would pre-warn the patients and say to them, do you realize that the third day can be most sensitive? What we do is we ask the patients to keep a log and a diary so that um, we can monitor on the third day. But we pre-warn them and tell them on the third day it's going to be really sensitive. You may want to stop and you may want to use your proprietary gels. The proprietary gels have got fluoride, potassium, nitrate, or amorphous calcium phosphate. And we always would give, when we do whitening, we always give our patients proprietary gel. Uh, we mentioned that's the Polar Soothe Ultra Ease from Optident or the Relief Gel from Philips. Um, and we would always give the patient a sample of Sensodyne or um, Colgate Soother. We would give them also the proprietary whitening gel accompanied with every whitening treatment. Um, and so we know that the whitening gel will penetrate inside the nerve within 5 to 15 minutes, which is why we want to sometimes block these exposed dental tubules, dentinal tubules, so that we can protect this area from being sensitive. So again, I'm happy for you to take a photo of this. This lists the different, re um, the different treatments that we can use when we are um, treating sensitivity. That is our biggest management issue. We want to pre-treat it or we want to um, modify treatment, uh, bleaching treatment protocols during the whitening so we can eliminate and reduce sensitivity. We don't want the patients to stop whitening during treatment. So um, we would give them patients a fluoride gel. You can place that in the tray, but or a, a desensitizing toothpaste. We want to do the active treatment or we want to do passive treatment. Passive treatment means we need to modify the bleaching technique. Often, although we've explained to the patients when we fit a bleaching tray, and that is our responsibility at the chair side, we would fit the bleaching tray, we place the gel inside the bleaching tray, and we show the patients how much gel to use. We then ask the patients to take a photo on their phone of the gel inside the tray so that they can remember how much gel to use. And it's normally only a centimeter of gel per application. So one syringe normally can last four uh, four to six days, depending on the thickness of the syringe, whether it's a three mil syringe or 1.2 mil syringe. So we would modify the bleaching treatment because often the patients forget our written instructions and they would think one syringe is for one night and they're using too much gel, which causes sensitivity. So make sure that they're using the right amount. If they're using a high strength 16%, you can always drop down to a 10% carbamide or a 5% carbamide to use a lower concentration. Um, I like my patients to use the whitening gel overnight, and I have to admit I've been using my whitening tray while I've been in lockdown. Not sure what you think, but anyway, um, and to actually heal my mouth, to um, heal the gingiva and to heal the throat, I have been doing the whitening. Um, I like to use it overnight. If you can't use it overnight, um, then I would use it um, for two hours a night. 
with the carbamide peroxide. If you're using hydrogen peroxide, you would use a half an hour a night. Sometimes, as we mentioned, use lower concentration, reduce your treatment time, and make sure the patient is only using a small amount. You can skip one night if it's too sensitive for the patients. Um, but you don't want them to stop. So these are the products that we use. Um, potassium nitrate works because it penetrates the nerve and has a calming effect. Um, it also affects the transmission of the nerve impulses and stops polarizing the nerve. So reduces the ex excitability of the nerve. Um, fluoride acts as a tubular blocker and affects the transmission of fluids, but not the transmission of the whitening gel. So the Polar Soothe, for example, is 6% potassium nitrate plus 0.1% fluoride ions and release the sensitivity. The patients would put that in the tray for half an hour before whitening or half an hour after whitening or instead of whitening. But this is really effective for the patients. So I do encourage you to give the patient a proprietary gel to take home. So you would, as mentioned, you'd use it before treatment, during treatment, or instead of treatment. And the contact time for the proprietary soothers would be 30 to 45 minutes. We also mentioned that those patients who have existing sensitivity, you can use that um, before whitening. For a week before, you can use the um, 30 minutes a day to soothe the teeth. Ultra Ease is mainly potassium nitrate with a tiny bit of fluoride, but maybe mainly potassium nitrate. And it penetrates the nerve, as we said, to have a calming effect on nerve and stop the excitability. So ladies and gentlemen, I want to say thank you so much, first of all, to Clive for organizing the webinar. It's really quite fun to talk dentistry. And hey, Tariq, it's really Hello. nice to see you. Um, I just want to say thank you so much for organizing this for 1,300 colleagues all over the world. It's so much fun to connect with you because being in isolation, I, I am in isolation with four, my four sons. There's seven of us isolating together, making 21 meals a day. is so much fun. But I just want to say thank you so much. I, I really enjoyed talking dentistry. It's been great fun. And um, to say to you, Please uh, follow me on Instagram, go on my website, go on YouTube, and thank you for the opportunity to talk to me, to talk dentistry tonight. I have missed it. It's been three weeks now. And also, um, I look forward to seeing you again. Message me on Instagram and we can talk, we can answer, I can answer some of your questions. So thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. I really appreciate it. You can also, I think the last slide, there was one more slide that did have my um, email, but you can get that off the website. It's lynda.greenwald at hampsteadhealthcare.org.uk. I think it's on, yeah. that's the last yeah. slide. So thank you so much. And thank you, Tariq, for recommending me to talk. And thank you to Clive as well. And thank you to all the colleagues for listening from all over the world. Thank yeah. you. Thanks very much, Linda. Um, thanks for you know giving up time, especially on your birthday. I hope you've had a good day. Um, <laughs> and, you know, even though you know, listen to your lecture a few times, I always pick up something new. Good. Um, so thanks very much for that. Um, and uh, as you said, obviously, you know, if anyone wants to um, contact me for any of the hands-on courses in Glasgow, uh, please get in touch um, through this OrgentumStudyClub.co.uk website. Um, also, the feedback forms um, will be going out from tomorrow. And if anyone's not got any email from us by the end of the week, then please either check your junk uh, folder first. Um, and then if you haven't got anything, then please contact me. And you know we'll make sure you know you get you get that through. Uh, again, Linda, thanks very much. Thank uh, you. And you know thanks for giving up your time. And you know it's good to see you. And hope you hope you're doing well. Yes. Um, thank you so much. It was lovely to see you. And thanks for organising it. And thank you to everybody for listening. I hope I hope you find it interesting. Yeah, no, it's been, it's been excellent. Thanks very much again, Linda. Take care. Great. All right. Thanks everybody. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye.
Now we've all stopped social contact due to coronavirus. There are lots of things we can still do safely, like phone and video calls with friends and family and staying active indoors. You can also exercise outside once a day, two metres away from others. Older people or those concerned can call Age Scotland for advice, free, on 0800 1244 treble 2. For those most affected by coronavirus, there's a wide range of organisations that can support you and your family with the latest information and practical advice at readyscotland.org. Please protect yourself and others. Protect Scotland.